Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Their Own Words podcast. My name is Danny. And my name's Ava. And today, we're going to be talking about Easter in Victorian England. We thought it would be the perfect time to talk about Easter traditions as we are in that season ourselves right now. Actually, a lot of our Easter traditions come from the Victorian era. And similarly to a lot of our Christmas traditions, this probably has something to do with Queen Victoria's German roots, where a lot of these traditions were imported from. For example, the Easter Bunny, which may or may not be pagan in origin. Nobody's really quite sure. But also painting Easter eggs and hiding Easter eggs. As a 14-year-old girl, actually, Queen Victoria writes in her diary, quote, Mama did some pretty painted and ornamented eggs, and we looked for them. So already when she's a young girl, the Easter egg hunt is happening. Now, when she marries the German Prince Albert, he would begin to make this a tradition for their children. And naturally, people tried to emulate what was trending in the royal household. So as they did their own Easter egg hunts, people in Britain also began adopting this tradition for their kids. Eggs, by the way, are not very pagan in origin. While they are kind of a long-standing symbol of new life and have been used in pagan traditions, when it comes to Easter, actually, the church was very early to adopt eggs as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. And in the Orthodox Church to this day, it's still very popular that Easter eggs are in use on like an Easter Sunday service. And the shell's meant to represent the tomb of Christ. Now, chocolate eggs at Easter are a little bit different. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Ava? Yeah, chocolate eggs became popular during this period, during the Victorian era, mostly thanks to the French, who were the first to figure out how to preserve chocolate in moulds. I wonder if that's why Belgian and Swiss chocolate is still so famous to this day, being that they both have very large French-speaking populations, and they were kind of the first to figure that out. I don't know. Yeah, and chocolate is so popular at Easter because traditionally, um, what comes before Easter, Lent. Um, And one of the things that people would usually fast from is uh, sweets during this 40 days preceding Mm -hmm. Easter in the Christian calendar. These 40 days are meant to represent the days that Jesus spent fasting, the days that he was out in the wilderness. And eggs were also on the list of things not to eat during Lent, uh, hence pancakes on Shrove Tuesday. But um, anyway, when Lent finished on Easter Sunday, people would then both indulge in eggs and also in chocolate. So this association of chocolate and eggs, though it seems weird, is actually quite natural in in terms of its Mm. origins and history. That's interesting. Also, Cadbury, the best chocolate maker out there, made its first chocolate eggs in 1875. There's nothing I love more than Cadbury's chocolate, British Cadbury's chocolate as well. It is the best, actually. And I can't imagine a world without many eggs, so... I know. Poor poor Victorians that had to just suffer through those years without many eggs. That would have been tough. I know. And it's really unfortunate that here in Calgary, for some reason, we can only get those giant bags of Cadbury's mini eggs at Easter time. The rest of the year, they're not available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Okay. Sidebar about chocolate. It's the best. Uh, It's Easter, though. So we're eating chocolate. Uh, The Victorians are also known for sending cards at Easter time. Now, calling cards were already kind of a uniquely Victorian phenomenon that sort of died out in the early 20th century. Um, What these were were like little personal business cards, essentially, that you would send your servants off to drop off at someone's house to let them know you wanted to call on them, or you would leave one behind if you'd called and no one was home. So essentially, they were already into cards, the Victorians, but when the, the uniform penny post came into being in 1840, that made it affordable for everyone to start sending cards around the country. Later on, they would actually make it affordable, just cost a penny to send cards right around the British Empire. So people began sending Easter cards and Christmas cards and things to family and friends. So this was also quite a popular tradition. So for the Victorians as a whole, Easter would have involved painting eggs, hiding eggs, eating chocolate if they could afford it, sending cards, and of course, attending church services. Religion being very fundamental and very prominent in Victorian life. But Overall, really not too different from today. So to kick it off today, we're going to read a brief excerpt from the diary of Francis Kilvert, a Victorian clergyman who was known for having kept a very fastidious diary. I actually feel a bit guilty we're kind of breezing over him because he's actually quite famous for keeping this diary. It was a big hit around the middle of the 20th century when it was finally published. The years, I believe, from 1870 to 1879. So as a result, he's quite a well-known Victorian. But in any case, this is what he had to say about Easter Sunday, in 1870, the year he began his diary. There was a very large congregation at Morning Church, the largest I've seen for some time, attracted by Easter and the splendor of the day, for they have here an immense reverence for Easter Sunday, 
when he says here, he's talking about Clearo, which is in Herefordshire, where he was curate. The anthem went very well, and Mr. Baskerville complimented Mr. Evans after church about it, saying that it was sung in good tune and time, and had been a great treat. So, funny, there's a couple things to notice here, I think. Number one, a very large congregation, and then he also compliments that the tune was sung really well, which is apparently a great treat. So, maybe normally at church there wasn't a lot of people around, and the music wasn't as good. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned the idea of the large congregation, uh, the largest he had seen for some time, um, because it's it's just so indicative of how, you know, nothing is new under the sun. Even though Britain in Victorian times was, was still largely a Christian nation, much more than it is today, you still had your people who only attended on the holidays, uh, on your Easter's, on your Christmases. Um, and that's perhaps why there was such a large congregation, the largest that um, Kilvert had seen for some time, because normally maybe there's a lot fewer people who actually come every Sunday. Yeah, and, and I think what's, what's quite interesting about that is there was still, I think, on the surface, this very proper way of doing things the moral code was still it, w- it was expected of you to conform to this moral code and yet maybe you didn't show up to church on sunday so i'm not sure but that seems to be a, a bit of a hint to what the reality was we think of it as everybody went to church everybody did the thing but maybe there's a little hint there that it wasn't all yeah. fine and dandy yeah. okay so the next excerpt we're going to read is from the diary of peter king he was a patient in St. Thomas's Hospital in London, which we'll speak more about later when we get to our episode on Florence Nightingale. But this is quite an interesting glimpse uh, to how Easter was celebrated in the hospital, which it very much was. It really, from this diary, you can see that they didn't miss it, and it was still very much celebrated even while people were sick. So this diary entry is from April 3rd, uh, which was Good Friday. Today is Good Friday and treated in hospital exactly as a Sunday. The dresses do not come and Sister does not enter the ward till later. Shortly before 11 we had service. Sister presided. We commenced with singing the Passion Hymn, O Come and Mourn with Me a While. We had morning prayer and the proper psalms and lessons followed by the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. So again here, this is really interesting because he said it's treated exactly as a Sunday and on Sunday the dresses don't come, the Sister doesn't enter the ward till later. So again... The idea that Sunday is a sacred day, everyone understands that religion is important, and yet, even though we don't have people maybe going to church every Sunday, they're still going on special occasions, they still respect the Sabbath, essentially. Yeah, I think uh, that's kind of like how businesses used to be closed on Sundays. That was very commonplace. Mm -hmm. It was actually against the law until the early 1980s to have your business open on Sunday. Um, And even after it was kind of, uh, it was made that it was optional to open your business on Sundays, most people for a while afterwards would still have their businesses closed on Sundays. Mm -hmm. It was very much codified into British society. Okay, we actually cut that diary entry April 3rd short um, because the the tone of the entry takes a little bit of a turn. Um, Not that it was super full of emotion to begin with it's pretty pretty straightforward but he actually goes on to say we should have had some more hymns had not the surgeon come up to perform an operation on a little boy who had been run over on clapham common by a bolting horse three other little boys were also hurt one died shortly after admission one was discharged and the other is in a dangerous condition so even on good friday well it's interesting actually the somber mood of good friday typical in church service would maybe be reflected in the hospital this day because even more poignant is this little boy who loses his life and gets admitted. But there's some uplifting parts to having a service, having people come and take a break from the mm. daily trials, I guess, of running the hospital and take a moment for religion. And then yet this sort of happens out of the blue mm. and kind of puts a damper on everything, mm. really. That's Victorian life, really. Yeah. Okay, so he also mentions morning prayer in his Good Friday entry. He's not just talking about a prayer in the morning. He's actually talking about the morning prayer, which is a daily ritual or order of service that's performed in the Anglican Church. And we'll get to that a little bit later. I'm going to read you guys a little bit of an excerpt from that, which is a book that is very influential in English church tradition. It's very poetic, and Victorians would have been intimately familiar with this service that he's talking about. And so we'll get to that after we read his Easter Sunday entry. Okay, so this is April 5th, uh, which was Easter Sunday. 
The day opens fine. At our morning service, we sang Easter hymns, such as Jesus Christ is risen today. The ward was beautifully decorated with spring flowers and potted plants, which gave a nice cheerful appearance and reminded us of the country. So how nice that people actually went the extra mile to make mm. people feel good about something, even when life was looking pretty grim in the hospital. Yeah. People are dying all around you. They just had someone die, that little boy on Friday. But there's a pocket of brightness on mm. Easter. Okay, so I'm going to read to you guys from the Book of Common Prayer, which is the book that contains all the order of service for the Church of England. So in here is a prayer that very likely Peter would have heard read on Good Friday, and I'm going to read it to you guys. We humbly beseech thee, O Father, mercifully to look upon our infirmities, and for the glory of thy name, turn from us all those evils that we most righteously have deserved, and grant that in all our troubles we may put our whole trust and confidence in thy mercy, and evermore serve thee in holiness and pureness of living, to thy honor and glory, through our only mediator and advocate, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So very poignant language there, actually, talking about looking upon our infirmities, to be reading that in the hospital on a mm. good Friday. I'll also read the collects that begin a lot of these services. So the collect for Good Friday says, Almighty God, we beseech thee graciously to behold this thy family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So that's the collect from Good Friday that he probably would have heard, and the collect from Easter Sunday is as follows. Almighty God, who through thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, hast overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life, we humbly beseech thee, that as by thy special grace preventing us, thou dost put us into our minds good desires, so by thy continual help we may bring the same to good effect, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So the Book of Common Prayer, it is very archaic language, been the same since major revision in 1662, but this is a book that Victorians would have likely known in and out because they would have heard it every single Sunday when they went to church, unless they didn't go to church every single Sunday and they only went at Easter, in which case maybe they'd be familiar with those yeah. passages. Well, that's all we have for you on this bonus Easter episode of Their Own Words. So tune in next Tuesday when we'll be talking about life in the workhouse. Thanks so much for listening, guys. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email us at theirownwordspod at gmail.com.